Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. While you're turning there, uh, let me uh, recap a, uh, an article that was published in August 14th, 1997 in the Houston Chronicle. Uh, it records the story about Princess Diana's death. It stated that uh, the early morning hours of August 31st, the princess died in a Paris hospital after a violent car accident. Uh, according to her psychic, this tragedy was not supposed to be a part of her future. Just a few weeks before her death, Diana went with, uh, I'm going to try to pronounce his name, Dottie Alfay, to see a fortune teller on August 12th. They spent almost two hours with a psychic in Chesterfield, England. The couple sought guidance on their future, and it appeared they received some great encouragement. One witness said Di was grinning all over her face. And looked like she had received good news. Nineteen days later, she died. Um, I say this with no disrespect to anybody that's passed or or, or anything like that. I I say this because only God can truly declare, I know the plans that I have for you. I know the future. Only God is able to do that. Only God is able to map things out. Only God is able to say, I know exactly what's going to happen to you tomorrow, next week, next year. Uh, he says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. An expected end means he knows exactly where you and I are going to be. He knows exactly the path that he already has laid out before us. And he's the only one that can do that. We don't know really what's going to happen next. Now, I say that with some hesitation because obviously we know what the Bible has told us. Obviously we know, like we talked about last week, Christ is coming back. He's made that promise. He made it very evident. Uh, We don't know when he's coming, but we know that he is coming. And for this reason, we need to make each day count uh, for his kingdom. Uh, This was the central message of James. Uh, James 4.14 tells us, uh, you know not we shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then what? Vanishes away. Now, be careful there. He's not saying, James is not saying that your life is not worth anything. James is saying your life, is, it, in the overall scheme of things here on this planet, is pretty short. It, it, you don't have a lot of time while you're here, so get busy, is what he's trying to tell us. This is also the central theme of our uh, message today in, in our journey through the Bible. Uh, we're in Second Thessalonians. And remember last week we looked at the end times. We looked specifically at the rapture. Now Paul wrote in First Thessalonians to clear up some false doctrine and, and to comfort uh, the young church at Thessalonica. He says here in First Thessalonians 4.18, Wherefore, Comfort one another with these words. What did he just say? Uh, Paul uh, just went on to write. He said, guess what? Christ is coming back. And he's going to come, and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then we will be caught up. Remember, we talked about that word caught up. We talked about all of these these aspects of, of the rapture, the end times. This is all going to take place. And then Paul says, comfort one another with these words. Uh, Paul does a good thing here, right? It's it's good to comfort each other, correct? It's good to to back each other up. It's good to encourage each other. It's good to, it's good, right? Yes? You can do this. Yes? It's good. Amen. Excellent. We got an amen. People say that when you amen, the preacher never stops talking. So, you know, I'll blame it on you today. Okay? So, so this is also a a, um, kind of, we looked at some of the the evidence for a pre-tribulational rapture. And this is kind of one of them too. If, if, how else would you be able to comfort one another if it wasn't a pre-tribulational rapture? I mean, think about it like this. Uh, Tim, you and I, you know, we, we kind of we get together. And, I, and I'm going to encourage you, okay, Tim? I'm gonna, I, I say, I say uh, hey, Tim, how about we, uh, you know, we're, we're about to go through the most intense destructive destruction and pouring out of God's wrath in all of history. But, but don't worry about it. Be encouraged. Um, Sit back and enjoy. Uh, 
You want some sweet tea? We'll watch the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse come riding in and destroy one-fourth of the population. So be comforted. No, no it, this, is, this is one of those things that Paul says, no, guess what? Christ is coming back. So comfort each other through that, with that, with that knowledge. And that is a good thing, yes, a very, very good thing. One problem happened, though. The Thessalonian church uh, took this message and they misapplied it to their lives. Um, we see that apparently many of them, after they heard this message, just kind of gave up. Uh, Paul gives them this message. Uh, he says, Christ is coming back. And, and they kind of just gave up. Um, in their mind, uh, we believe, they started thinking, well, if it's all going to end soon, then why bother? Uh, you, ever, you ever been there? You ever get to the point in your life where you're like, what's the point? I mean, think about that for a little bit. That, that's, a, that's a big part of, uh, of what many people go through today. They, you know, with, with all the things that are going on in the world, uh, you know, we hear the stuff about ISIS and, and, and political corruption and the, the Ebola stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff going on, and, and, and sometimes you can be just like, what's the point? If Christ is coming back, what's the point? And, and that's, that's where, that's where they, were, they were at here. They weren't working, they weren't sharing the gospel, they weren't planning, they weren't growing, they weren't, they, they, were, they were just waiting. Inactive waiting. So Paul quickly wrote the second letter to the Thessalonians to kind of instruct them on what they should be doing while they're waiting. Paul made it clear that uh, while uh, waiting means working, not wasting time. It means doing something. See, waiting doesn't necessarily just mean standing around letting the world go by. And, and Paul's very clear. Don't just do that. There's stuff for you to do. There's stuff for me to do. It's a message that we need to apply to our lives today as we, we wait for the return of our king. So we're going to look at two, two aspects of, of how we're supposed to live our lives while we wait. Next week we'll, we'll look at the third one. But this week uh, you can follow along in your notes. How are we supposed to live while we wait for the king? What's life supposed to look like? Because after he comes, life is going to look very different. It, it is going to be incredible. It is going to be glorious. It is going to be beyond our wildest imaginations. I, I got that. But what about now? Do we just throw in a towel? Do we just kick back and wait and do nothing? Paul kind of clears that up right here. So you can follow along in your notes. First of all, the way we live is we live victoriously. We're to live victoriously. 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 through 12 says this. Wherefore also, we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our Lord Jesus, our Lord, and, uh, our, our grace of our God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We have three, three marks here of victory. He, he says, he says we've got to live victorious. The battle's won. We've got to live victorious. And there are three marks. How, you know, you, gotta, you sit back and say, how, how do I know what victorious living looks like? How do I know I'm living victoriously? He kind of maps it out here. The first aspect of a victorious life is, is walking worthy in the eyes of God. <laughs> Man, you know, this is what we all long for, right? This is what we're all shooting for, right? This is what every, child, every single child of God is doing right now, right? Trick question alert. We may crave it in our heart. We may crave it in the depths of our soul. But are we actively doing it? There's a difference there. There's a difference from wanting something and doing it. How many of you have ever wanted to start an exercise program on January 1st, but didn't, right? Think about that. How many of you have ever wanted to cut out sweets, you had all the good intentions to do so, but it didn't really kind of happen? How many of you have wanted to read through your Bible in a year, 
and then you get midway through numbers and you kind of trail off. All right? Wanting something, desiring something, and actually doing it. Unfortunately, not all the same thing. But, but if we really understood what Christ is saying to us here, what God is saying to us here, I mean, the first time I heard this concept of, of walking worthy in the eyes of God, of pleasing God, I almost exploded with joy. I, I, I read these words here in Matthew 25, uh, 21. It says, His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. How many of you want to stand before God someday and him look you right in the eyes and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. How many of you want that? How many of you crave that? How many of you think that would be like the pinnacle of your entire existence? God himself saying, you, you did what I wanted you to do. You finished the race. You fulfilled my plan for your life. And son and, and, and daughter, you did a great job. Come on in. For me, you know, I, I understood this parable uh, to be applied to my walk with my Heavenly Father and how, how He has given me, He's given me the privilege of pleasing Him. Now think about that. Wrap your mind around that for a second. God has literally given you and I the privilege of pleasing Him. How many of you like to make people happy? How many, of you like to, how many of you like to give gifts more so than receive them at Christmas time? Most of us, you, we, there's, there's a different kind of pleasure in it, right? There's a different kind of uh, uh, um, uh, excitement to it. And here, but here's an opportunity to bring a smile to the face of God. Here's an opportunity to, to give God something. Remember that statement, what do you give the person that has it all? The only one in existence that has it all is God. So what do we give him? We give him this. We can walk worthy in his eyes. We can, we can, we can strive for this. We can, we can reach for this. And this dates all the way back to the beginning with Adam and Eve in the, in the garden. He gave this newly married couple everything they would ever need. But the greatest of all was the ability to please their creator. So, so it, this is kind of what he, he kind of says. He says, Adam, name all the animals. That's great. He, he's got a job. Okay? Uh, name all the animals. Uh, both of you tend the garden, be fruitful, multiply, partake of all that I've given you, but don't eat of that tree right there. And in this, God gave human beings the opportunity to openly worship and please him through what? Obedience. Through obedience. I, I have, I've been to uh, worship seminars and, and, and um, where they, they, they try to show you how to do uh, uh, the music part and the lights and the, the this and the that. The best one that I've ever, ever, I ever gone to said nothing about music, said nothing about lights, said nothing about colors. It said everything about obedience. How do we worship God? If you boil it down to the very core, whether you're singing, preaching, teaching, laughing, uh, uh, being a, a, the parent you're supposed to be, being the employee or employer you're supposed to whatever you're doing, you boil down worship and walking worthy in the eyes of God to that one word, obedience. <laughs> Incredible. It's the key to walking worthy for the child of God. Eighteen times through Scripture, we read obedience to God directly related to our love for God. Uh, John kind of nails it here. In John 14, 15, Christ says, that, see that first word? What's that first word? What is it? If. It's a tiny little word, isn't it? Almost insignificant. Right? I mean, it's, it's minuscule. It's two letters. I am a horrible speller, but I've never had trouble spelling the word if. Ever. My, my, on my computer, my, my uh, spell check never tells me I spell the word if wrong. It's a little tiny thing. But it is so key. If you love me, 
there are a lot of people that say they love God. There's a lot of people that say they, they do this and say they do that. A lot of people can, 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 can voice it out. And, and God said back in your, he said, he said, your lips speak one thing, but your heart is far from me. So Christ kind of makes it, I, I like the way he, he kind of encapsulates in the entire aspect of walking worthy, pleasing God, worshiping him. If you love me, keep my commandments. <laughs> it's the evidence of our new relationship with God. If you love me, keep my commandments. I think that things in our world can get very, very complex very, very quickly. And I think we're uh, um, the problem in that. We like to make things confusing and complicated. We like to put, you know, lists of things and, 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 and different steps to do this. And di- God says, Christ says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You want to walk worthy? You want to you wanna bring a smile to my face? You want to show me that you love me? You want to fill my love? God says, you want to fill my love tank? Obey me. You want, to, you want to speak my love language, God says? Obey me. Walk in the commandments that I've given you that are for your good. <laughs> that are for your good. Uh, and that will be loving me. And that will be walking worthy. It's the evidence of our, our relationship as a child of God. So that's the, uh, how do you know you're walking victoriously? You, you're, you're, you're striving for that, that, that obedience to God. You're striving for that walking worthy in the eyes of God as we see here in, in 2, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1. Uh, but we also see uh, that, God, that as children of God, we've been granted power, authority, and responsibility. How do you know you're walking victoriously? You're walking in power. You're walking in power. Take a look at John 1.12. It says, as many as received him... To them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, we understand that the, the whole concept of receiving him has everything to do with repenting, turning from your, 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 the sin in your life, turning to him, and, and humbly surrendering, your, surrendering yourself to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He said, at that moment, I call, you, I call you son, I call you daughter. And he says, as a son, as a daughter, he's given us power. We can walk in power. Now, the Greek word for power here is exousia. Exousia. And it means jurisdiction, power, right, responsibility that comes with authority. It's important to understand what God's talking about here. It's important. We've got to be careful. This is not the type of power that the world is seeking after. It's not entitlement. Or the concept of being above the law. In fact, true power and leadership carries with it servanthood. True power and true leadership come with the responsibility to lead, invest, and impact other people's lives. (laughs) To their good and to God's glory. You want to walk in true power? Look at how many lives you're impacting and how you're impacting them. That's true power. That's the power that's described here. That's this word exousia. Walking around in the power of God is not naming and claiming this or that. It's not uh, uh, having enough faith that, that tells you that you deserve a better job or a better house or a better car or a better life. That's not the kind of power that's being spoken about here. This power, this power is a powerful faith that transforms you and transforms me into what God wants us to be in order to help impact and transform others. That's true power. You, wanna, you, want, you wanna exercise a victorious life, exercise the true power that God has given you, impact someone's life, your wife, your husband, your kids, your parents. Yeah, kids, you can, you can impact your parents. Your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors, true impact, your, 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 your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. That's true power. And I know people are going to disagree. Well, no, God wants to give us this. God says, I'm going to make, I'm going to give you power as one of my children. It's liberating. It's transform. It's revolutionary. Our Lord modeled it himself. 
Would you consider Christ a winner or a loser? It's, it's, it's almost laughable to even say that, isn't it? It's almost laughable. It's, well, yeah. uh, if anyone can claim victory, it's Christ, right? Do we all agree on that? If anyone in all existence can claim true victory, complete and total victory, it's Christ, correct? Let me ask you this. When did he gain his greatest victory? On a three-day period, the cross and the empty tomb. Right? The cross and the empty tomb. Now, you know, the Romans were probably looking at that saying, this is your king? Until Sunday came. And that changed everything. But, but Christ said he gained the victory at the cross. At the cross. That's where it began. So, so we see here, and, and, and what was that all about? That was Christ walking in power. His, his, one of his greatest displays of power was dying on the cross for all of existence, for all the people of all, uh, and, and then rising again three days later. That's where he gained his greatest victory. That's where he exhibited his greatest power. Yeah, he healed people. He rose people from the dead. He, he multiplied uh, fishes and loaves. He, he, he calmed the storm with just a word. He created everything in existence with just a word. Incredible displays of power. But his victory... We read about this, we talked about this yesterday in the men's study. His victory, the bruising, remember guys, the bruising of the heel and the bruising of the head? The victory was at the cross in the empty tomb. That's where, he, that's where he demonstrated his true power. Power to impact lives for all eternity. You want to talk power? Oh my goodness. And he's given us his very power. As his children, we can impact others. So we got, we got this concept of, of, of walking worthy. We have this concept of, of walking in power. But we also have this final concept for victory, and that's glorifying God through our lives. We can bring glory to God. Greatest sermon ever preached in the history of mankind. Anybody know where we can find it in the Bible? Matthew. Sermon on the Mount, that's right. And, and remember this sermon, uh, our Lord was very, very clear about our marching orders. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, he says, Let your light so shine before men, that they see your good works, and give you praise, and pat you on the back, and give you a trophy at the end of your life. I think I misquoted something there. Nothing about that. Nothing about trophies and ribbons and badges and pats on the back. and Nothing about that. He says, he says, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works. Now, let's be honest. When we do something good, we want a pat on the back, don't we? Come on. You're in church. You can be honest today. Right? Who, 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 who likes to get, and let's be, let's, let's be real. Let's be honest. Who likes to, to get, you know, you do something good, you like you like to hear about it, right? I mean, be honest. If your hand doesn't go up, my goodness, we're going to preach next week about lying. Okay? I mean, seriously, we do. Now, we like it to different degrees, obviously, and it may not be the main thing, but, but somewhere inside, it, it makes you feel good. There's, and, there's, and that's okay. That's okay. But he says, hey, you really want to walk in victory? You really want to really show off? <laughs> Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's the center of our life work. What we do, how we live while we wait, should display our king and his work in our lives. The way we, live, the way we live should light a path and lead the way to Christ. That's victorious living. There was a, um, there was a the importance of this is, is, is I, I cannot stress the importance of, importance of this. I cannot, th there, is no, there are no words that I've been able to come up with that can stress the, the, the vital nature, the importance of this concept of bringing glory to God. It's why we're here. But the importance of it, I, I, I found a really neat story that, that kind of maps it out a little bit here. It was the keeper of a lighthouse in Callis. And he was describing the brightness of his, of his lantern. 
uh, that, he, that he put up in the lighthouse. He said it can be seen for 10 leagues, which is roughly about 30 miles at sea. And a visitor had said to him, he said, well, what if, what if one of the lights should go out by some chance? The man was horrified. He said, never, impossible. He pointed out to the ocean, he said, sir, out there uh, where nothing can be seen, there are ships going by to all ports of the world. If tonight one of my lamps went out, very shortly a letter would come, perhaps from India, perhaps from America, perhaps from some place I have never heard, saying, on such a night, at such an hour, the light of Callus burned dim. The watchman neglected his post, and all vessels were in danger. He said, sir, sometimes in the dark nights, in stormy weather, I look out to sea and feel as if the eyes of the whole world were looking at my light. Go out, burn dim, never. Wow. That was a guy in a lighthouse keeping a lantern lit. This is the same exact concept. This is what it means as a child of God to live in such a way that we bring glory to God. Uh, we must never let his light go out in us or, or grow dim in us. We are to live our lives in such a way that when people look at us, they say, man, something is, is different there. You, you're, not, you're not living like everyone else. You're not moving like everyone. You don't talk like everyone else. You don't, you don't joke like everyone else. Something is up. What's going on in your life? And we can say, Christ. I, some, I had a, a friend of mine, this was years ago, uh, I, I was teaching, and, um, teaching at, 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 a, at a school, not, not, uh, not teaching Bible. I was teaching at a karate school. And, 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 and one guy came up to me. I just got through working with his, with his son the, the, the whole hour. Uh, it, it, was, it was a little difficult. He, he was struggling. But we, we kind of got through it. And the guy came up to me and said, man, what is up with you? And I thought, oh, did I say something wrong to his son? Did I, you know, because you know how parents are. You're one of them, right? You know how parents are. And I'm thinking, oh, what did I do? He said, he said man, you're, you're, there's, something, there's something different. What, what, what's going on? I looked at him, I said, well, not much, just God living in me. He looked at me like, where did that come from? And then I sat down with him, I said, I said, I said man, we're no different than each other, but God has changed everything. And I had an opportunity to sit down and witness to this man. This is, this is what we're supposed to be shining, reflecting, shining the light from ourselves, from our works, Shining it to Christ, giving Christ the glory, giving Christ the honor, giving Christ the praise. <laughs> Walking in obedience, by the way, and in power produces a life that glorifies God. That's true victory. So we need to live victoriously while we're waiting. Walking worthy of God, walking in his power, and glorifying him. That's how you can tell if your, your life has any kind of victory at all. It's not based on, on how much money you have, how many cars you have, how many kids you have or don't have. Or, or the, it's got nothing to do with any of that. Walking victoriously has got to do with, with, with this. Walking worthy in, in a way that's pleasing God. Uh, walking in power that is impacting other people's lives for God. And walking in a way that glorifies God, that shines his light, that shines a light on him and saying, hey, you need this. You need him. That's how we know we're walking victoriously. But Paul doesn't stop there. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he gives us the second part. We need to live victoriously, but we also need to live courageously. Courageously. Now you think the two go together, right? If you're walking in victory, then you must be walking courageously, right? It takes courage to gain victory. And there's a problem there. Who gained the victory? Christ gained the victory. So we gotta, so this is why Paul said, yeah, you need to walk victoriously, but guess what? You also need to walk courageously. And it says here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not so, listen to the way this is worded, that ye be not so soon shaken in mind 
or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as uh, from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Paul's saying, hey, listen up, people. Don't be weak and wimpy. Don't be fearful and fretful. Don't be scared and skittish. Don't, don't, be, don't be like the, be bold, be, be brave, be strong, be courageous. Pick up your sword, let's get into the fight. It's basically what he's saying here. Be courageous. This was not the first time that we've had a, a call to courageous living. Um, Joshua, remember Joshua? Joshua was an incredible person. But Joshua, Joshua was up against it. He, he had just uh, taken up the mantle of leadership from no other than Moses himself. Arguably, the greatest person, or most recognized person at least, in the Old Testament. Okay? And Joshua is given the mantle of leadership from Moses. He's going to lead God's people into the promised land. My guess, my, my uh, assumption in this is that he was a little scared, a little worried, a little concerned. Now, you're not going to find that in, in Scripture, except there's a reason why we read here in Joshua 1.7 where God sends him a message. God gives him a message. He says, God says to him, only be strong and very courageous. Do you encourage the courageous or do you encourage those that are struggling with courage? You encourage those who are struggling with courage. So that's why I'm, I'm saying what I'm saying here. He says, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Uh, do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. That's a pretty good motivational speech. Uh, Rick, you, uh, Monday morning, take this verse, get your, get your team together, and just read this verse to them. That's a pretty good, mo that's probably not going to work a whole lot. <laughs> uh, but but it's, it's more than a motivational speech here. It's so much more. Uh, God gave Joshua the key to living courageously here. Obeying God's law and not wavering from it. John Wesley said this. He said, if I had 300 men who feared nothing but God, hated nothing but sin, and determined to know nothing among men but Christ, and him crucified, I would set the world on fire. 300 people. Jesus did it with 12. Set the world upside down on fire. The bottom line is true courage comes from God. True courage comes from God. I've talked with military personnel who have been in battle. Every one of them, when they get down to the bottom, and they say they, 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 they say, they get down to the absolute honesty of it, they say, war is terrifying. War is scary. With all the training that they get, with all the technology that we have, everyone that I've talked to about it, and we, and we don't go into great detail, but they say, yeah, it's not like on the movies. It's scary. It's scary. And I've asked a few of them, where would you get the courage, the bravery to do that? And some of them said, yeah, the, the only real courage I've ever gotten is from Christ. It's from God. One soldier, a former Army Ranger, Ranger and Delta Force operative, put it this way when responding. Uh, he was responding to the threat. Uh, this terrorist group, ISIS, has thrown out this, this threat about um, uh, harming the families of military personnel. You, you've heard that? Okay. Um, as disgusting as that is, uh, one reporter came up to this army ranger and, and, and said, you know, asked, asked what he thought about that. <laughs> this is what he said. He said, my mother taught me to fear God and nothing else. Man, I am so glad there are people like that defending our country. You know? I mean, come on. He didn't say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a tough guy. I'm gonna, this is, a, this is a, an army ranger, Delta Force. This is not, um, what's, remember that old TV show with the goofy Gomer Pyle? This is not Gomer Pyle we're talking about here. All the kids are like, Gomer who? Gomer Pyle. I mean, ask 
your parents, well, maybe you could ask your grandparents now, I don't know. Um, this is, a, this is a, a mighty warrior. And what does he say? He said, my mother taught me to fear God and nothing else. That's where I get my courage. That's a good mom and a great lesson. 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 7 says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. How many of you believe that? Let me, let me, let's check this out. Let's find this out. Look at the verse. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And some of you may not be comfortable doing this or whatever. If you believe that, if you believe those words right there, raise your hand. Okay, you believe those words, yes? Okay. Why then do so many believers walk around captive to fear? We all believe it, correct? God is in control. God is on the throne of this universe. God is all-powerful. We, we get it, right? He's not given us a spirit of fear, correct? We all, we, we believe this. Then why, why do so many people, so many believers, walk around captive to fear? I think there are probably as many reasons as there are people, but I think it boils down to this. Uh, if, you, if you struggle with fear, if you struggle with with uh, um, this, this shaking of the mind, this, this nervousness, this, this anxiety, this tentativeness. I know there are a, a, a thousand different reasons why, and, and I'm not trying to discredit them, but I think it boils down to this. I think we need constant reminders that God is on the throne, that God is good, and that he loves us. I mean, my son asked me the other day, Dad, have you always been brave? My, my son, you ask my son, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm Superman incarnate, okay? Um, that's because he, he doesn't see me creaking and cracking as I amble out of bed in the morning, moaning and groaning. And I'm not going to tell him that yet. But, but he sees me as, as the, the physical embodiment of, of Superman. And he says, Dad, Dad, have you always been this brave? And, and I, I was honest with him the other day, dead honest. I told him, I said, you know what, buddy? When I was young, when I was a, 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 a young guy and, and a teenager and even in, into my young 20s, uh, I was a scaredy cat. I was terrified of so many things. He said, what? No way. I said, yeah, buddy. I, I walked around in fear. So what do you think he asked next? No? He didn't say what, afraid of what? Because I told him, I told him whatever. He said, how did it change? What changed? What cha because, Dad, you're like Superman now. What changed? And, and I told him, I said, I said, what changed was I stopped trying to get my courage and my bravery from my own abilities, and I started getting them from Christ and Christ alone. I said to him, I said, I realize God is on the throne. He is in charge and in complete control of the universe. I said, I said, buddy, I rest in that. I rest in the fact that I'm not calling the shots. That the bad man uh, who, who's trying to, to overcome me is not calling the shots. That the storm that's coming isn't calling the shots. That the devil isn't calling the shots. I said, I said John, first of all, God's on the throne. He's in charge. I said, secondly, um, if he was just on the throne and in charge, I'd be terrified if he wasn't good. But God is good. He is so good. <laughs> Which means, John, I can trust God with my life no matter what's coming at it. No matter what's going on. I can trust that he is good. I said to him, I said, it doesn't mean everything's going to be feeling good. But I can trust that God is good. And he's going to get me through it. I, and I said, I said and, and, and God loves me. He loves me, which means he has my best interest in mind. You want a cure for fear? You want to walk courageously? It may take you to remind yourself that God is on the throne, that God is good, and that God loves you. Talk about drawing courage. Admittedly, it takes time to figure this out. It takes going through some dark valleys and, 
and, and coming out on the other side. It takes seeing God work through some horrific situations and getting through the tough battles. Is there a chance that you may fail in something that you're doing in life? Is there a chance that you could possibly fail by put, in something that you're putting your hand to? Of course. Of course. Um, to a degree. To a degree. I'm not so sure about the, the totality of that anymore because uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57 says, Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I think ultimately we win. Okay, but, but even though overall victory has been secure, there's still daily battles, isn't there? All right? How many of you struggle on a daily basis? Maybe not every day, but you struggle with maybe walking right or you struggle with, with, you struggle with your, your language. How many of you work in a, how many of you work in construction? I know, Rich, you work in construction, right? Um, let me ask you this. Your, your crew, are they singing Amazing Grace all day long? They're not? Come on, it's a construction crew, man. I work construction. I know that they don't do that. As a matter of fact, when you do it, they look at you weird, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 you know, do, do you struggle with language? Do you struggle with, with relationships? Do you struggle? Are you struggling? Are you, are you, are you, are you full? Do you, we win. We win in the end. Have you been battling a sin or a, a struggle and you say, I just don't have what it takes anymore to keep fighting this. We win in the end. That is so liberating. So incredibly liberating. We win. In the end. Do, do you get that? I know you, some of you are waiting. Okay, are you waiting for something more? There isn't anything more. You're like, you're like okay, uh, let me say it again. We win in the end. Because our king has already secured the victory and he's given it to us. Talk about courageous walking now. Talk about walking bravely. Imagine going into your next battle knowing that God's already won. Imagine that. Incredible. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt uh, talked about living courageously uh, this way. He said, far better is it to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered by failure, than to take rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they live in the great twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. That's pretty good. That's, that's pretty good right there. I, I like that. I don't like everything that he's had to say, but I do like that. Okay? What's he saying? He's saying, you, you can't walk around tentative and weak. No, I'm not saying meek. Meek is good. Okay, meek is strength under control. But you can't walk around like a scared little kitty cat all the time. That's not exhibiting our God. That's not exhibiting Christ. I cannot picture Christ coming into a town... Scared. Imagine that. We read, I don't read anywhere in Scripture where it says, yeah, Jesus came into, into Galilee and he was scared. He was terrified. I don't read that. I read him coming boldly into town saying, this is, uh, this is the way, it's, way it is. And we're called to be that way. Take a look at John. John we, we start off with Joshua here, okay, how he was encouraged. Take a look at Joshua's final address to Israel after an insanely successful campaign to conquer the promised land. Uh, he says here in Joshua 23, verse 6, Be therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of Moses, that you turn not aside uh, therefrom to the right hand or to the left. The one who needed encouragement has now become the encourager. The bookends of Joshua's life were centered on, centered on this concept of living courageously, of walking with the confidence that God knows what he's doing and that God is capable of winning. How do you know if what you're doing now is what you're supposed to be doing? How are we supposed to be waiting 
for the return of Christ. We're supposed to be living victoriously, but we're supposed to be living courageously as well. In 1962, author Ray, ba Ray Bradbury wrote a book entitled, uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes. Any of you hear of it? Ever hear of that? Something Wicked This Way Comes. You, you've heard of that. He, he borrowed that, by the way, you Ray Bradbury fans. Uh, he borrowed that from William Shakespeare, the fourth act of, of uh, Macbeth. Okay? But in both cases, it was, it was foreshadowing the coming of something dark and scary. Something, something sinister, even. Bible prophecy clearly tells us that something wicked this way comes. Now, Christ is going to come and conquer that. But we read all through Scripture that you know, in the end times, there will be trials, there will be tribulations, there will be difficult times. Something wicked this way comes. Yet God, His kingdom, including the children of God, will overcome the darkness. Until that day, we are to wait. But not inactively, we're to wait actively. Someone once said, we have all eternity to celebrate our victories, but only one short hour before sunset in which to win them. I want you to think about that for a second. Think about those words for a second. We have all eternity to celebrate our victories. You know what? You and I, Rick, you and I, when we're in heaven, man, we're going to be celebrating things that we didn't even realize were victories. We're going to be like, what? Did, did you think that was a victory? You're going to be like, no, I had no idea. And we're probably not going to celebrate some things that we thought were victories, you know. But for all eternity, we're going to be able to celebrate them. We're going to say, hey, remember that? Remember what God allowed happen, to happen here or then or, or with that? And we're going to be able to celebrate for all eternity. But right now, while we wait, is the time to win them. Is the time to actively go out and do what we're supposed to do. And that is to live victoriously and live courageously. Next week we're going to talk about the third part. Uh, but, but here at the church of Thessalonica, they had, it, they had it backwards. But Paul made it clear that, yes, the victory is secure. But we got to get busy while we're waiting. Let's pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Let me, let me ask you something. And, and, and some of you have been here for a very, very long time. And you've heard me say this over and over. Every single week. Literally every single week. For the last eight years. But if you have not responded to the call of the Holy Spirit of God. You have not been given victory. You cannot possibly walk courageously. Because you don't know where you're going. You don't know that when you close your eyes for the final time, you will open them up in heaven. You don't know that. You can't say that for sure. Many of you can. But maybe, maybe someone today is thinking, I, 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 don't, I don't know. And I'm not trying to make you doubt your salvation. The Bible is very, very clear. Uh, we read in 1 John chapter 5, These things have I written unto you that you may know you have eternal life. So I'm not trying to get you to doubt your salvation. I'm trying to get you to make sure of it. Jesus makes it very, very clear. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me, he says. Jesus doesn't say, uh, yeah, you've got to do this, that, and the other thing. Cross these T's, dot these I's, dress this way, part your hair this way. He doesn't say any of that. He says, there is one way to get to heaven. It's through me, he says. Through his atoning death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave. Trusting in that. It involves turning from our sin and turning to God. Now, once you've done that, I mean truly done that, you can never lose it. You didn't gain it in the first place, so you can't lose it. But maybe, maybe you walked in here, or maybe you're listening today, and maybe, maybe you don't know. And I'm telling you, you don't have to walk out of here that way. You don't have to, you don't have to end this day not knowing. 
The Bible says, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Now, many of you have already done that. Praise God. That is great. If you have, pray for those that are listening who may not have. Uh, but if you're here and you're not sure, right where you are right now, this moment, you can talk to God. Right now, you can say, you can talk to him right now. You can say to him, right now, right where you are, you can say, Lord, I'm not perfect. I have sin. And I am so sorry. Now you can say this. You can say, Lord, I, I don't understand it all, but right now, as best as I know how, I turn from those sins. I repent. And I turn to you. And I surrender to you, Lord. And I place my faith, my hope, and my trust in your risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Everyone's head is bowed. Everyone's eyes are closed. My friend, heaven is an incredible place. And for all eternity, you and I who have placed our faith, our hope, and our trust in Christ, will get to live there. And, and the, the majesty of that cannot be even described in a couple of moments. But if you just surrendered to God just now, my Bible says you're going to be there. And you're going to be able to dwell with Christ forever. My Bible says all of heaven right now, this moment, if you, if you have done this just now, if you, have, if you have turned from your sin and you've placed your faith, your hope, and your trust in Christ, if you have just done that, my Bible says all of heaven is erupting in joy over what you just did. Surrendering to the work of Christ. And I would love to pray for you. I'm not going to make you jump up and down. I'm not going to make you come up here. I'm not going to make you do any of that stuff. But I would like to know who you are because I want to pray for you. I want to keep you in my prayers throughout the week. So if you did just pray that and, and genuinely from your heart, you sincerely prayed that, could you do me a favor? Nobody else is looking around, just myself. Could you lift up your hand? You can put it right back down. I just want to see who you are. Just for a moment. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for those who have called upon your name today. Father, I thank you that you allow us to walk in victory, that you allow us to walk courageously. I ask, Father, that you would allow us, help us, uh, strengthen us to, to surrender more and more to you each day. Help us, Father, to get busy while we wait. We know you're coming back. We know uh, that everything's going to change. But while we wait, help us to wait actively, not inactively. Father, I ask that you lay your hand of blessing upon each and every person here today. We love you. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.